This is the second half of a two-part video, so if you have not seen the first half, you might want to watch it first. If you have seen the first half, I want to remind you that we ended it by asking you to ask your production manager what percent capacity utilization he or she ran their manufacturing processes at. Now I can tell you the highest number I've ever heard was 80%. But think about that. Aren't they saying that on any given day they could get 20% more work done? Are they crazy? Wouldn't you like to get 20% more work done? Why do you think they're wasting all that precious time? Well, it's simple. They know something. They know that if they put more work into the system, they would actually get less done. Let me tell you a secret. The only reason they can run at such a high percent capacity utilization is because they have highly repetitive, low variability processes. They do the same thing over and over and it always takes about the same amount of time. Now, if they had some processes that took twice as long as they expect, they would actually need more spare capacity. And the reason is that this curve actually starts turning up sooner for processes with more variability. So let me ask you, do you think product development is a high variability process or a low? And then let me ask, what percent capacity do you think product development is at? In most organizations, it's at 100%. So is it any wonder we're in this gridlock traffic jam situation in product development? So now we need to find a way out of this mess. Now one obvious thing we could do is add capacity. That would be like adding a new lane to the highway, but it has its drawbacks. First of all, it would be very expensive. And what else do you think would happen if you hired 40% additional resources for product development? Don't you think that eventually someone would come along with more work to do to use up all that spare capacity? That's right, so we have to think of something else. Well, our second option is called Manage Demand. And this is exactly what manufacturing is doing when they're limiting their workload to 80% of their maximum potential. But what would that look like in product development? Now, I'd guess that most of you have more than one project in product development right now. In fact, your project load might look something like this. The resources axis is on the left, and it's the people and money you have available. Along the bottom axis is time. Now it can be in months, quarters, or years. But let's say this company is working on four projects at once. Now what would happen if we delayed two of them and put all of the resources on the other two? Now I know I said delay, but stick with me here. Wouldn't that decrease my capacity utilization of the resources by 50%? Now think back to that capacity utilization curve. Wouldn't that cut my cycle time by a whole lot? Now, depending on where we were on the graph, it should cut it by way more than 50%. But let's assume we have work like life cycle testing that can't be compressed. So we only finish these projects in half the time. Then what do we do? We start the other two. And look what happens. We get revenue early from the projects we completed early. And then we get the benefit of a late start on the other two. And by that I mean your market window is now only 12 months out and not 24. And you have a chance to incorporate all of the things that you learned in the past year from those previous projects. Now then, I know this may be difficult to believe and impossible to do in some cases, so is there anything else we can try? Well, actually there is. And I think I can explain this with another story that we can all relate to. Let's say that you and I are the vice president and president of a company. And I've noticed that when people leave for lunch, it takes them an hour to get back to work. And I'm thinking, if we had our own on-site cafeteria, people could eat here, and we would get an extra 20 minutes a day of work out of them. Now, we compare this added productivity to the cost of building the cafeteria, and it looks like a good deal, so we go for it. Now, it's opening day, and the bell rings, and there's 60 people in our company. So we all get up at once, and we go stand in line. And you and I are the leaders, so we go last, and I'm actually the last person in line. Now let's say it takes an average of one minute to serve each person. So how long does it take for me to get through the line? 60 minutes, right? But it didn't take everybody 60 minutes. What was the average wait time? 30. Wow. 
So you and I are meeting after lunch in my office, and I'm kind of discouraged, but I have an idea. See, when we got to the seating area, there were a lot of seats that weren't taken. Some of the people had already finished and left. So I'm thinking we could use that extra space, make the kitchen bigger, add another stove, add another cook, add another server, basically increase capacity. But I ask you for your idea. What, what can you think of doing? Hopefully you said, Dave, why don't we try releasing everybody in two separate groups? Half the group goes at 11.30 and the other half goes at noon. Now I'm thinking about this and I realize, wow, that doesn't cost anything and we could try it tomorrow. So I agree. The next day, you go to the first group, I go to the second. We meet in my office again after lunch. And I ask you, how long did you wait today? Wasn't it 30 minutes? But again, that wasn't the wait time for everybody. What was the average wait time? It would be 15 minutes. So did you get this? We just cut the average wait time from 30 minutes to 15. We cut it in half and we didn't change anything. Well, actually we changed one thing and that was the batch size. Now then, are we done or is there more we could do? What would happen if we cut the batch size again and sent a group of 15 people every 15 minutes? Wouldn't the average wait time be seven and a half? Let's keep thinking about this. What could we ultimately do? We could give everybody in the company a sequential number and have them get up and go to lunch one minute apart for a whole hour. And the wait time would be zero. So do you see what we just did? We cut the average wait time from 30 minutes to zero simply by cutting our batch size. So let me ask you, where do you think the batches are in new product development? Pause the video for a minute and start writing them down and I'll give you a hint. They're everywhere. So are you getting this? Great. So let me summarize. I hope you now understand these four points. The first one is easy. We want to make a profit. But the biggest opportunity for achieving that happens to be product development velocity. And that's because of the additional market share, sales, and margins that you enjoy while you don't have competition for your new product. By the way, I highly suggest you model these four costs for your projects. Even companies that think they know their cost to delay are usually underestimating it by a long shot. So then I showed how capacity utilization has an exponential impact on cycle time. And then I gave only two of the examples of how you can decrease cycle time without increasing capacity. And they were manage demand and reduce batch sizes. There are others, but we don't have time for them here. So does that change how you look at things? I hope so, because I started out this video with a quote from Stephen Covey stating that paradigm shifts are necessary for quantum improvements. And most people would agree that cutting development cycles by more than half and then doubling or tripling the number of new products you make in a year would be a quantum improvement, wouldn't you? Now that's it for this video. If you liked what you saw here, be sure to check out the one on the business impact of lean product development. I'm David Paulson from McCure. Thank you for watching.